So tonight I'm pleased to welcome our guest speakers, Roberto Tejada and Sean Noriega. Uh, Roberto Tejada is an assistant professor at University of Texas, Austin, in the art history department. He's the author of many books, including not one, but two that just came out this year. Apparently one of them he hasn't even seen until today. Um, the first one is National Camera, Photography and Mexico's Image Environment, and also the book Celia Alvarez Munoz. Um, he's served as co-curator on the exhibition's Manuel Alvarez Bravo Optical Parables, which was at the Getty Museum in 2001, and um, Luis Gis Gisbert Loud Image at the Hood Museum at Dartmouth. He's published critical writings on contemporary U.S., Latino, and Latin American artists in After Image, Aperture, Bomb, The Brooklyn Rail, SF Camera Work, and Third Text. And tonight he'll be discussing his research on the work of the provocative and pioneering Chicana multimedia artist, Celia Alvarez Munoz. And please silence your cell phones. Um, he's joined tonight by UCLA's own Sean Noriega, who is a professor in the UCLA Department of Film, Te Television, and Digital Media, and is the director of the UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center. Chan is the author of Shot in America, Television, The State, and the Rise of Chicano Cinema, and he's the editor of nine books dealing with Latino media, performance, and visual art, including this one, which we're selling in our bookstore upstairs, Chicanos in Film, Representation, and Resistance. Um, in addition, he's curated numerous art projects, including LACMA's recent Phantom Sightings Art After the Chicano Movement, which I'm sure most of you have seen. Uh, they will both be joining us upstairs for a book signing after this project, uh, after this talk. So I hope you can come up and join us. And now please join me in welcoming Roberto Tejada and Sean Noriega. I should warn you that Sean knows that I indulge by laughing at his jokes, so. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, thank you all for uh, joining us. Uh, Tonight we were doing this sound test, and it it's, uh, seems like we're supposed to sing uh, up here, but we'll try not to. Um, Roberto, great to see you. Likewise. Um, we, I have not seen this new book, but it was uh, shipped in overnight from uh, the printers. So you will be seeing it. Ah, hey, that's a nice book. You wrote this? <laughs> they say. <laughs> um, this, uh, this book is the third in a series that uh, we started some time back, um, about eight, seven, seven years ago. Uh, and Rita Gonzalez uh, was very helpful in, in uh, doing the research with me to kind of lay the argument for the, for the need for this book. But it started um, a very simple phenomenon, which is uh, I love going to bookstores, uh, especially museum bookstores. And when I go into them, I like going to the artist monographs. Uh, the books on individual artists, and I just spend a lot of time there, and I, I like going through the different ones, whether they're deeply historical or more contemporary. And you have some series like Tashin, where they have the little carousel, and you can flip around and uh, look at a wide range of artists, and they're very heavily illustrated. And what I noticed, I never saw the artist I knew, even though I knew some fairly established artists, some, some people that I think have made uh, significant contributions to 20th century art, uh, but they just weren't there, but I kept looking. Uh, and at a certain point I realized, well, I'm not going to find them. Uh, Faden, Taschen, any of the series that uh, specializes in monographs uh, were not uh, uh, providing, dealing with them. And, and most of these artists, uh, very few of them, uh, were fortunate enough to have a kind of museum catalog with a series of essays that focused on them. So we decided to just do research uh, and we developed a list of about 100 artists' names, and these were artists born before 1970, so they were 35 years and older uh, at the time, um, and who had enough of a career, uh, an established career through solo artist shows and whatnot to, to become visible, for us to know about them. And we ran their names through uh, ULAN, the United List of Artists' Names, and a number of the major search engines that are used for art history and what we found, we graphed um, onto a series of charts. We ran, it ran maybe about 10 pages long. And there were probably about three Xs signaling that we had found something <laughs> for an artist. Uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres and Judy Baca were the two artists that really had uh, been written about beyond just little paragraph blurbs uh, related to an exhibition. 
So we thought we had a good argument uh, and a need for specifically bringing extended attention to an individual artist and heavily illustrating um, uh, selections of work spanning their career that would be the basis for an argument about their work. Uh, so there's not a pretense at a comprehensive encyclopedic, um, but rather a, a critical survey across, across the work. And uh, the first book that came out uh, was on Gronk, and that came out uh, two years ago, and then last year we had a book on Yolanda Lopez, and this year we're gonna have an addition to the book on Celia Alvarez Munoz, uh, one on um, Mario Brito, Cuban-American artist, Carmen Lomas Garza, and uh, Malakias Montoya, well, um, probably early in 2010. We've got about 15 books that are commissioned, and the idea was to look across uh, different Latino groups, but uh, having settled on, on artists, uh, more or less, uh, we picked 15 artists, but it could have been 15 other artists, uh, just given the pool we had. Uh, but to, to link them up with writers where they had a, they didn't necessarily know each other in great depth, but there was a productive tension uh, across generations, sometimes across ethnicity, uh, sexuality, uh, region, but th there was some basis for a critical engagement uh, and, and to just uh, give them as much support as we could. So uh, one of the interesting phenomenons that I hadn't really thought about, um, although I had experienced it as a curator, is working with the living artist. And I've known Sally almost 20 years and she's a wonderful person, but I, I, th I think my first question for Roberto would be, uh, just the process of getting to know her and, and researching and writing about an artist while they're there in the room, so to speak, and, and what that process is like. Because I, I think it's a very distinct challenge in, in critical work on art and artists. Well, I remember coming into the project with a kind of confidence that uh, later made me humble because I thought, you know, there's a, there's a format and a very distinct structure that Chan and the staff at the uh, Chicano Studies Research Center had elaborated in which the series would involve no more than 90 pages, more or less, of the body of the text, and then there, the, the researchers there would also help with the bibliography um, and front matter. So it seemed that really all I had to do was write four interrelated essays. <laughs> and first, to embark on a project which would be first interviewing Celia Alvarez Munoz, who I knew not well, but briefly I had been involved in a curatorial project in Guadalajara uh, with Carlos Ashida and had curated some photo camera generated work from Mexico City and Daniel Martinez had curated some camera generated work from the United States and Wendy Watrous had brought in Celia Alvarez Munoz to do an installation, one of her works from the mid 90s on the, the feminicide in, in Ciudad Juarez. Mm -hmm. and uh, I hadn't really followed Celia's work after that, and all of a sudden I was very kindly asked to um, be pitted with, with Celia, and I start, my initial research, as I remembered the work, was this seemed like a perfect fit. Um, Celia's work is very writerly, and the tensions that her work produces are between um, these narratives that seem to have a folk or um, traditional basis, but she's really working within an avant-garde uh, vocabulary. And in the two or three interviews that I conducted with her, I remember sending the tapes to Rita, and they were transcribed, and I read the tapes and I realized I was a really lousy interviewer. Uh, insofar as I was much more interested in carrying on a conversation than actually having the critical distance of an oral history to find, to get to those things that, were, that might uh, have illuminated or illustrated what I was supposed to be writing about. So um, with the patience of Chan and the editorial staff uh, at UCLA, I, I um, realized that I had committed to something that I really didn't know how to do, which was I didn't know how to write a monograph. Be that insofar as if I was going to write a monograph, I didn't want to write a monograph in the way that I had read monographs that um, didn't, I didn't want to follow the life and narrative format. So that was the first um, wall I ran into. But to answer your question, I think what happened was that by following Celia's work, which allowed for the kind of thematic play, um, I was able to divide the, the book into um, 
a lesson plan because what I found out was that Celia, really before coming into um, her practice as an artist, rather late in life, she had already um, was the mother of two children uh, and in her mid-40s decides to go back to get her MFA at the University of Texas at Denton, at the time a hotbed for avant-garde practice. And yet there's something still about the pedagogical moment or about the teaching moment that was influencing and um, framing her work in every aspect. And so I decided that was my perfect lead. And uh, that allowed me to be able to, to follow Celia's lead, basically. She gave me the lead, um, which also allowed me to have the kind of, writing about a living artist is, is difficult because I, you have to start framing that work which you think is the most relevant, which may not be the work that the artist, him or herself, thinks is most relevant. Uh, and because I was not going in the art historical, uh, chronological order, this also involves some intense and interesting and insightful dialogue with Celia. But I think all of this actually added, I hope, to the to the structure of the book. It's an interesting challenge because the, the, for these artists, this is the first time somebody has taken an extended look at them. And, and what I found is uh, their fear was that this would be the last word on them. And as the last word, it had to be right. That was definitely Celia's concern. And they've, they've all felt this, and it, it's interesting. And, and we actually sat in a room <laughs> when we first put this project together and said, no, no, no. We hope this is the first word and, and believe it or not, my ideal, what I expressed to them, is that Celia, somebody will be reading Roberto's book, a graduate student, they'll get pissed off, they'll throw it across the room and go, this is just a piece of shit, I can do better. And exactly. they'll go and they'll write a dissertation that's 300 pages long, not 100 pages. And it will begin an argument. But I think because there's been, uh, and, and you know, she's 72 years old, mm -hmm. uh, there's been critical silence about her and about that whole generation of artists. Uh, who are in their 70s and 80s at this point. Right. So it's, a, it's an understandable fear. But what I found interesting is you, you, you structured this book around a series of cultural moments. And you explore those and then how they work back to Celia's own uh, family biography. And there's a kind of uh, similar process in, in the work itself, that it's kind of calling those two things out. I, I tend to write books backwards. So I, or somewhere in the middle and then work my way around it. But I think that um, finding the, the cultural moment was finding a hook and that mm -hmm. that hook would have to be the, the hook for the, for the four different essays that make up the, the book. And it did come from Celia's lead in so far as there will always be some uh, very important anecdote and her work has this uh, way in which you think it only relies on a anecdote or that it stays at the anecdote but you begin to realize as you dig deeper that this is, it has really profound resonance both historical and cultural resonance so um, at some point we'll, we might look at some images but what she really does is use a family tale or legend or family lore to talk about much wider and broader historical movements and I just followed her lead on these Sometimes it would be her grandparents crossing the border uh, uh, from, t from Mexico to Texas, or it would be um, about uh, Chicana and Mexicana labor strikes in Los Angeles in the 1930s, or it would be the very interesting history around Snug Harbor in uh, New York as a um, haven or refuge for um, uh, aging sailors, and this is where she had installed one of her of her pieces. So I just followed those as kind of the the entry point. Um, and since her work is circular, it allowed me to do the same do the same thing. Now the the point inevitably comes though where the artist is going to disagree with you, and part of the the negotiation we have is this this is really supposed to be someone else's perspective on the artist. Uh, the, the manuscripts are reviewed by leading art historians. Uh, we're kind of holding your feet to the fire, but at the same time, there's the artists on the other ear, and they've got their own sense of how their, uh, what their work means or what it doesn't mean sometimes. Uh, how did she respond? In general, uh, she was thrilled. <laughs> uh, however, there was one 
And by the way, Celia says she's here on the wall. Uh, she's flying the wall. She says she's listening to this as we're talking about it. But, but one of the things that had come up in an, inter, uh, in an email exchange, because by the end of the, I didn't want to bother her through the writing of it. So for all the fact checking, I did that at the end. Um, and there were dates and so forth that um, were, that I had, I had um, introduced some errors. But after, after cleaning those up, um, the structure of the book, as I'd mentioned, the four lesson plans were one in geography, two in the language arts, four was in civic studies, and number three was in home economics. And I actually found out as I was doing this research that home economics is actually this really interesting uh, PhD granting uh, uh, discipline that began at Cornell and other grant land uh, institutions in the 30s that allowed for, that for all its kind of constricting for certain roles for women actually allowed for a greater participation in um, the economics and, and, and social life of the United States. But for someone of Celia's generation, understandably, I think there was some resistance to using that title. And actually, it's, it's, it's very much a wordplay. I was using her own kind of wordplay because I'm not only talking about home economics in terms of um, say, the labor strike, which was, which was of dressmakers in Los Angeles, but also the kind of home economics in a piece she did in, at the Cap Street Art Center in San Francisco about LGBT, queer, gay, lesbian youth who were having difficulty with their families. And you had actually, many of them had left places like Texas to go to San Francisco to uh, get away from the kind of strictures that they were experiencing in their family life, in their home. And Celia's work is also very communal insofar as she will usually create these workshops, writing workshops, to get students to create texts that later find them, this text finds itself on the wall or in some aspect of her multimedia work. Mm -hmm. So that was one, one, in, one situation that I finally, I think I finally convinced, made a strong case so that she didn't feel that that was um, representing her work in a way she didn't feel that, what, mm -hmm. that, would, that would best suit her intentions. You know, one of the things about this book, and, and I think we'll, we'll move with this into uh, looking at some of the work, is you're a pretty hip, cool guy when it comes to contemporary art uh, theory and criticism. And you kind of know that history within which she's clearly working. But because she's dealing, she's not in New York. She's, she's on the margins. She's in South Texas. Uh, she's dealing with uh, cultural, uh, historical, and linguistic references that are really outside the emergence of an international kind of conceptual image text artwork. But she's in many ways uh, very much within that idiom. Um, so the challenge, how do, you, how do you make that point without special pleading uh, or without uh, claiming a radical difference that's really not there in some ways. Uh, uh, you've mentioned a, kind of a listening, and she talks about listening. And yes. The work is so deceptive and so uh, clean in some sense, uh, simple, uh, that you could miss some of the complexity. And so maybe you can uh, begin, show us a piece, or kind of take us through a work and talk about some of the, these challenges in terms of locating her in art history. Great. Well, talk about that that first sort of generally, and then we can move more specifically mm -hmm. to maybe three works. But that was, that became abundantly clear at, just in the first essay that I began to work on, which was that this is an artist about whom there was no reason that there should not have been more written about her, insofar as it was work that could have been shown in the art centers, Los Angeles or New York. Um, the, even, we'll see the, one of the first photo text image pieces called Enlightenments was very much in line with the kind of work that Barbara Kruger was doing in New York mm -hmm. at the, around the same time. Uh, the kind of uh, museum interventions that she, was, that she was involved with were making direct references to the kind of feminist practice of uh, Mary Miss, for example, uh, and others that were, and then the whole kind of sly ways that she makes these art historical references that are never they're irreverent, but without being disrespectful. And, and mm -hmm. she, in, a, in a way that she really wants to insert herself into a modernist and postmodernist tradition, uh, but without giving up the specificity of the borderlands from which she speaks. So yes, the very, the very intimate kind of language that may come out of her growing up on the Juarez El Paso 
border, from a Catholic, largely Catholic upbringing, from the voices that are from uncles and aunts and her uh, very lively family that you get, um, are references that I think were usually seen, dismissed as being folksy or um, cozy in some kind of, in some kind of a, a way that didn't have the, that assumed a, a lack of rigor that in fact she really has. Now there, there is a moment where she is getting some entree through the drawing center and then the 1991 Whitney Biennial. So the, the, there is there's some overlap there uh, at a key point. Yes, and usually there would be, um, as we'll see in one of the latter pieces, I've only chosen really four, that they were usually museum commissions. And I think really one of the breakthrough pieces is the one that we'll probably show at the end, which is one that was commissioned by the Dallas Museum of Art. Mm -hmm. And I think really was that pivotal point in which she was no longer producing work that had resonances from her work with um, Vernon Fisher and Al Souza at uh, the University of Texas at Denton, but that really showed that she could move the book art or the artist book from which she really had her origins, that is open up the page into museum space or institutional space. So at the same time she's being, uh, it's an interesting dance and a delicate one that, she, that she's able to achieve insofar as that she's being invited by institutions but really shows ways of critiquing the institutions or at least showing a kind of um, uh, cheerful or lighthearted or carefree critique of the, of the institution at the same time. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can just open up the, uh, I think our names come up here and then I have to do this. Well, like let's, let's stop and look at that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> we could do a textual analysis yeah. of... Break it down. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very in keeping with Celia's work. Oh, I don't know. I brought up just... Um, one of the things that was... In, that, the joys of being able to write this was that I had to follow Celia's lead, and one of them was, um, you'll, you'll see as I show further on, that postcards become a very important aspect to Celia's work. And so I became a fiend of eBay insofar as I started uh, uh, bidding on auctions of, that were postcards from El Paso or Texas from the 1940s to get a sense of the kind of image culture, the image environment, the image world that, in which she was uh, clearly influenced by. Um, so I just wanted to show this kind of work. And I think that postcards for Celia are also a kind of surrogate system of the art world insofar as that they circulate in, in, in these kind of circuitous ways and they have, um, uh, they have an arbitrariness to, to the way that they find themselves in a, that a postcard will arrive at through the post office or be sent through the mail. Mm -hmm. So these are things that she uses in other of her works. So I just wanted to give a sense. Uh, I'm gonna have to move this this way. Oh, and I, I guess I just briefly wanted to uh, talk about <laughs> uh, one thing that was that the only good thing that came out of my interview with Celia was a dream, and I, is, it, I, is this the dream? This is the dream. <laughs> I actually found this image later, but uh, Celia related an. Uh, this is very at the end of the. I had to refix. I had to. I, I needed a better hook for the introduction. And then I, I had remembered that Celia told a very uh, meaningful dream that was a recurring dream that I had completely repressed or had forgotten about. In insofar as she has this recurring dream in which she is playing in a marching band. This is very 1950s. She's growing up in 1950s in the borderland. She's playing in a marching band. She sees herself in the band, but she's also above the band, watching herself playing in this band. And of course, the marching band is a kind of militarized standardization of, in the US. But it also seemed to me that it was that writing about it or dreaming about this as if she were both in her body and above this um, this marching band gave me the idea of underplay. And in, in fact, what Celia does is always use the sort of the minimal critique that, to underplay, just sort of marginally or slightly, sweetly subvert her, her theme. And this is something she does over and over again. Uh, Roberta, let's hold on here. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably the first time I've heard of someone repressing someone else's dream. <laughs> as a way of developing a heuristic for understanding that person's work. This is all about my desire. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll end the session right here. So let's see some more of your work. 
Oh, and then I just want to, these are just things that were, that, that were comparatives that, uh, so anyway, this is a Fleer's funny, why can't you tell, oh, this is a Muscles, who's a recurring character in uh, the Double Bubble, Muscles, why can't you tell me where elephants are found? Well, the punchline, of course. Is because Fernando elephants. Lichtenstein here? Or what <laughs> <laughs> because elephants are so big, they never get lost. Um, in another work that I'm not going to show, she does use uh, the Double Bubble comic strip as something that was important as a kind of anecdote about what well, I think about image culture. And as a child, she would, there's one of these artist books uh, in which she and her uh, cohorts as, as children would wait in line to buy bubble, uh, double bubble bubble gum. But again, what was, so I started collecting double bubble comic strips. And I found this one, which really also gave me the lead about this idea between teacher and student. And it's this kind of riotous school rock insertion, you know, insurrection of muscles, who's the wiseacre, uh, sort of always having the, la the last line or having the comeback to the teacher. And this is going to be important to the next, and I think one of perhaps her most well-known work called Enlightenment's Number Four. But you also, you also take that back into the deep history of bubblegum itself, which involves Mexico and uh, the border. Yes, that's right. <laughs> uh, that, so that chapter begins with uh, Santa Ana, the... the, the uh, Erstwhile. Yeah, the Erstwhile uh, General Santa Ana, largely hated because of, the, uh, uh, because of his negligence. The state of Texas uh, was, became part of the United States. But it was also General Santa Ana who brought chewing gum to the United States and started really the Beach uh, Chewing Gum Company because he gave it to Adams, this Mr. Beach, Beach Ad Beachwood Adams. Or Beachwood what? Adams, who later commercialized bubble gum, which was used in World War II which relates to her father's experience as a soldier in World War II. So these, these, all these cultural um, artifacts are both important at a cultural level, but also at a personal level in terms of her own storytelling mm -hmm. and her, her own narrative. That's right. So that's, this, this is the double thing, and the double, the double wordplay that she's always um, involved with. So this is Enlightenment's number four, which came first. And to show you the, the her roots, really, her origins are as a, an artist bookmaker. And we're going to see the sequence of five images that can be placed variously on the wall or can be contained in this um, um, sort of deep yellow canvas box that contains it. And uh, the work really depends on kind of getting the narrative. So I'll show the five and you'll, we'll read the text. I don't know if I'll be able to read it from here, so I actually brought it so that I won't mess it up. But it begins with these, these minimalist eggs in a row on this dark yellow background. And you probably, I don't know if you can see the type, but I'll read it just in case. Can everyone see it? Um, learning to speak and understanding chickens were the hardest things for me during the primary grades. One, the chicken will lay an egg today. I would always ask. How does a chicken lie an egg? Two, the chicken laid an egg yesterday. Uh, I would sit attentively for hours in front of the chickens in hopes of witnessing the event. Read the bottom part. Yes, the chicken <laughs> has laid an egg already. Thanks, John. <laughs> and then finally, uh, unfortunately, they were always too fast for me. Five, the chicken lies every day. Um, what seems like a sweet story in which Celia has her son write the awkward sort of childish um, lettering on the bottom and this narrative between, it's unclear who, who the speaker is, uh, recalling perhaps a childhood um, instruction in a common mistake for a, a, um, a subject acquiring the English language seems deceptively, again, as you said, deceptively simple, but if you begin to sort of dig deeper uh, uh, around the kind of cultural context, especially of, of Celia living in the borderlands at this time, sort of it, it, this, this particular image seemed to give, give me a lot and to give, I think, just gave a lot. Um, one, I mean, just to sort of begin, was that uh, there seems to be a constant... Uh, reflection on minimalism and post-minimalism with the sort of the, Don the Donald Judd boxes have become these sort of natural eggs. And the natural eggs are kind of a, uh, 
the eggs are a natural counterpart to the culture of, of mass-produced objects. Um, there's this underlying sexual joke about eggs, which in Spanish is often, you, you have to come up with these great circumlocutions so you don't say the word huevo, which is a reference to the male genitalia. And there's a sort of this idea of, the ch of, of these childhood mistakes in language as being sort of the first um, ways in which we begin to feel shame about uh, sort of sexual awakening. And, um, and just basically in terms of how language acquisition takes place at the, in, this, in this particular time in, in history. Yeah, it's interesting because the two, the two texts, the, the typed and then, which is in the present tense, and then the handwritten, which is clearly kind of evocative of a child's lesson plan, um, they're, very, they're very close in space. Uh, one is not an ironic and informed comment on the other. Uh, and as a consequence, it seems like this piece really captures something uh, about introduction into language in general, but I think in particular, and, and for Celia's generation, my father's generation, introduction from Spanish in the home to formal and oftentimes forced, violently forced, uh, acquisition of English in school uh, at the same time without any Everyone's bringing up a Spanish word directly. Yes. Huevos kind of is hovers the, there, right. among other things. But, um, um, but I, I think it captures something about that moment that is like the chicken and the egg. It, there's not a definitive nailing down of that moment and, and what it means. It's, it's a being caught in between things. And, and I think it's interesting. She doesn't take the ironic position of the fully informed, acculturated adult. Right. Uh, she's kind of occupying a middle zone, which I think oftentimes makes it harder to read because it's not uh, the easy iron, irony that you sometimes get with conceptual work. Right? right, nor does it have the easy ending in which you can feel satisfied at having sort of yeah. um, aligned yourself with one of the speakers, right? The adult and the childhood speaker or the sort of the, the conflation of the two. Is there, did she do some more work? <laughs> this is just to show the, this, the one of the ways in which it's been, yeah. it's been shown. Now, I'll have to say, she did approve the color we have on the cover, which is not yellow. So. <laughs> I don't know why, but she went for a kind of a burnt orange. The, th this is also one of these, the narratives one, uh, narrative ones, it's called La Yodo. This is, and, and this is um, when she's still basically a, an MFA student at Denton. She's produced this, this Enlightenment series from 19, 1981 to 1983, four more or less. And so this, is, this also tells a tale, and again, the, the, the speaker is not entirely informed from an adult perspective looking back. It has this kind of interesting uh, slippage. So it says, if everyone can, can everyone read it or should I read it? Layodo or iodine was the name I gave my imaginary friend. She was fair and light complected. She had a brother who we watched play in the snow when we had to stay indoors. He was older. Layodo was always getting into trouble, so I would take her by the ear as punishment for her actions. The other day, I called my mother to ask if Layodo was ever real. Yes, she answered. She lived a block away from our house. Her name was Honey. And she was a very sweet little girl. Um, the turning of the head as we start getting into the, the, the kind of um, relationship between this speaker and her mother, clearly recalling some childhood um, important object relation between uh, herself and this, this doll uh, becomes also in sort of the way that she's including and excluding the viewer from ever having direct access, I think, to this kind of intimacy is one of the things that she does so well. And then, of course, getting uh, this whole uh, what's involved in having an imaginary friend and the fact that she was light-complected, the kind of ways in which one feels both abject and 
yet identified with this doll in, in, in this sort of childhood um, uh, play environment, I think really is, is, is not as sweet. It actually has a kind of really dark underside, which makes itself apparent as we begin to see this hairless doll turn her head away from the viewer and therefore kind of obliterate us or from, from possibility of identifying. Mm -hmm. well, some, somebody's pulled that hair on. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, this is, it's a very eerie uh, piece, and, and, and I've, I've encountered other stories like this that are dealing with um, whether it's individual or social traumas, in that sense of, of really not being certain what was real and what wasn't. And what she's narrating is her own cruelty, yes. in a sense. And yes. her mother is saying that cruelty was real, and there was this nice little girl down the street that used to pick on, essentially. That's one level at which you could read it. Right, which she, has, which she only remembers as this relationship with this doll. Right. With, a, with an imaginary exactly. uh, friend. Yeah. So the question is, what, what is being narrated? Is this purely an a, a individuated or eccentric sort of, of dynamic in terms right. of, of, of repression. Because her work is always conjuring up uh, the, the unconscious or the psychoanalysis in one sense. Right. Um, but there's also that element of race, which is very kind of lightly, right. literally kind of introduced. Or does the mother misremember? Yeah. Right, because the mother may have completely misremembered as well. And, and so the, it's all about the, the wishful thinking of, of, of of greeting the ghost from the past, the kind of returns, right? Well, the mother was unaware of, of the daughter's fantasies of dealing with racial difference and the hierarchies that were being introduced into her life. Yes. Right? So, mm -hmm. it, 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 I mean, there, there's something really fascinating about it because it doesn't nail down very easily, no. but uh, it, it, you have the sense of her having captured something very uh, ineffable about uh, these transitions in childhood. Um, I agree. So what else do we have? We have one that you've, that you've written about. Oh, I've written? Yes. This is, um, again, to go back to the idea of the postcard, um, Celia's training was really, as a, before she goes to art school, is as a graphic designer. And she actually was able to get a um, scholarship to go to the, what is now the University of Texas at El Paso, uh, Western Texas at the time. And many of the early works were kind of these uh, airbrushed, representations of homes that she studied in El Paso and the kind of uh, homespun decoration and pride of certain homes in, in uh, El Paso. But it, again, she does this thing in which the viewer doesn't necessarily always have access because in each of these uh, images of the homes, the, the doorknob is missing. And so you have sort of these extravagant um, uh, 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 extravagantly painted doors, these, these uh, unusual sculptures on the outside and so forth. And she hangs these in the space with, with these letterings of streets that are actually streets in Houston, Texas, Houston, uh, San Antonio, and Austin that are spelled out according to the way they would be mispronounced depending on whether you're a native English speaker or native Spanish speaker. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and the work we've seen thus far, I mean, it's, it's work that can travel at one level very easily because it, it's, it's all in English. The presence, uh, the insinuation, the implication of another language is one level of reading that's open to you, um, but it's not a necessary one. If you don't speak Spanish, if you're looking at this right. in New York uh, uh, and there's not a sense of, uh, of there being a Southwest as... Um, an aspect of contemporary art. Um, you don't need to. It, it can be purely psychological uh, within a kind of generic white middle class framework. Um, at the same time, you can read a lot into it uh, because there are the cues there, but they're, they're very kind of lightly suggested within English even. Right, well. Uh, this is a piece where I think, and it's, and it's, it's the work that I think gets the least integrated into the discussions of, of contemporary art, where she's very directly addressing where English and Spanish uh, come into conflict uh, and where the conflicts that exist on an economic and a social and a political level uh, can be found in uh, the landscape, can be found in the language that marks that land. And so here you have Martinez and, and uh, Martinez, but in others, she's got the Myrtle Street and uh, Which is muerte. Muerte, right. uh, death. 
And there's a way in which you, you can begin to see not just the play of the language, but some of the consequences of these two kind of uh, linguistic frameworks. And also who has the, who's entitled to, to mispronounce and who isn't. I think that's also one of the things that's in, that's in play. So Guadalupe becomes Guadalupe. Right, and to, to this yeah. day in Austin, Guadalupe. It's, Guadalupe is still Guadalupe and it won't change, right? So yeah. this, is, this is one of the things she's addressing. Ah, here's a better one. But you have Olive and, and Olivo. I love, but my favorite is uh, Kiambol, which I have now forgotten what it is. Campbell? Yeah, something. <laughs> yeah, Campbell. It is Campbell. Campbell. Um, Tejas and Tejas and Guadalupe and so forth. Uh, a spruce would be Spruce Street. Um, this is now moving into the 1990s where uh, she has now been, been commissioned to do works for either group exhibitions or on her own. And this was one at the Snug Harbor Cultural Arts Center in, in Snug Harbor in New York. And this, I think, is, a, is a, also a centerpiece artwork insofar as it was the title of her um, mid-career or... Um, survey exhibition that was, that took place between uh, 2003 and 2004, entitled Stories Your Mother Never Told You. In this case, the, the work allows her to use both her incredible uh, deafness as a draftsman, as a, um, in, that she, draw, she draws these elaborate, um, in this case, a tree of life, uh, a Mexican tree of life, which was a um, manual art in, in, in Mexico as it's pitted by this 1930s Art Deco dental cabinet from a dentist. And in this cabinet, maybe I'll have to move to the next image just to get a sense of what it does. She writes these stories uh, that she includes in, the, in one of the drawers as well as these plaster casts of, the, of, of dentistry somehow conflating sort of forensics because teeth were used to identify uh, cadavers and storytelling, and identif and sort of making this reference between sort of the, the 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 long lines or the historic lines of storytelling and gene genealogy and lifelines of the tree of life, and the kinds of communities that are enacted by storytelling. That somehow storytelling is what binds a community together. And so, for this particular instance, and this is, this is a piece that traveled. Um, elsewhere in the United States, she would have these paper scrolls on one side of the wall on which viewers would come in and write their own stories that their mother never told them. Um, so again, it's also by it's sort of the negative way of getting at a story is to tell the story your mother never told you, uh, which also again harkens back to, the, to excuse me, to Layodo, where this is the, the story that she remembers and the mother remembers in a very different way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's always, a, there's always a, a disconnection or a disassociation between the way a family remembers a story and the way that a society allows us to remember a story and the way an institution, in this case, uh, a museum space, uh, allows for viewer participation or not. So I wonder if we can uh, maybe ramp up and move to a discussion part by showing a limite. Oh, okay, yeah, I think that's next, actually. I wanted... So, for example, she just gave me some of these stories that she collected, which were on the wall of the um, museum. So, <laughs> I like number three. Mi mamá nunca me dijo que los hijos más queridos son los menos esperados. Ordens, I never believed half the stories my my mother told me mentiras. Um, and she collected these at every instantiation of this of this exhibition. So I think we'll move from one that I sort of mentioned, the border crossing one. It's in the book, though. It's in the book. <laughs> More postcards. Also in the book, yeah. And we can get to uh, El Limite. Did you want to sort of start on... No, you wrote about it. <laughs> <laughs> from the mother, now we go to... Again, these, these seemingly um, domestic spaces are actually opportunities for Celia to talk about mm -hmm. history in, in a much larger sense. And in this um, photo-based murals and 
drawings on the walls of the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego entitled El Limite, uh, she's able to activate a number of things. One, the importance of the railroads in um, Mexican-American history insofar as during the revolution was the first wave in which many Mexicans came to the, came to the United States uh, and worked on the railroad through the Bracero program, for example, and in fact, um, uh, many, um, Many historians have, have, have made reference to the way in which Mexican bodies were employed during, during this Bracero program, but then um, not given the, the right to full citizenship. And in this case, uh, Celia's father was a child on the borderlands in, during this time, and uh, she remembers stories of her, uh, her father telling her that he would build these sort of toy trains, which make reference to the, the way in which the borderlands really was made possible through the opening up of the of the railroads from Mexico to El Paso, for example, or to San Antonio. He'd make them out of sardine cans, though. And yes, so he would make these small toys out of uh, carnation milk cans. I'll get to the close-up. Maybe I can do that right there. Uh, this is Celia building the building the uh, trains with the curator Madeline Grinstein at the time. And here we go, the first of two basic, two large photo murals that tell this story, and they're two short texts as well. Um, I can barely read that. Stories by Dad came, I might have to do this. Stories by da Dad came from two sources, invented and the real life adventures, at times hard to separate or distinguish. In Las Arenas, near the railroad tracks, they played with toys made out of things that don't belong together, like combinations we were warned against. Nunca, never eat watermelon during a certain time of the month. Nunca toma leche cuando come pescado. Nunca toma un helado cuando agitado. Let's just read the other one. Oh, here, I should have read the <laughs> one that's a little bit easier. And then here's the second train. Is there one after it? Yes, let me read that one. <laughs> I'll be straining my... Uh, you're, you're, learn, you're adapting. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Some stories stem from trips to the Golden State on trains. He jumped on in El Paso during the Depression years. My favorite stories dealt with the war when he was moved across the world and throughout Europe, again, mostly by train. Little do we know that colic couplings may well become the main ingredients required to survive. And... I think it's this, this idea of colic couplings was something that I just found very, uh, perfectly describes so many of, of Celia's pieces insofar as um, she brings things that are seemingly unrelated, that is what seems like from the folk tradition, but that is actually as expressed through an avant-garde um, uh, or a modernist um, uh, form, um, the colic couplings are the ways in which we have these uh, uh, sort of folk knowledge about what we should, the do's and don'ts about eating certain things during the time of the month, for example. Um, and all these are sort of loosely describe a kind of relationship to her father, but also begin to talk about sort of larger questions about the colic couplings, I think, that are these kind of ruptures of history, as was the um, this sort of mi mass migration of Mexicans to, mm -hmm. to the United States during this time. Yeah. Yeah, and this piece is one of the, my first introductions uh, to her work, and it's, you know, the, what I came away with the sense is she's really a poet, and, uh, the, and, and particularly a bilingual po poet in terms of the play between, uh, between languages. But you get that phrase, the colic couplings, and the way in which colic and coupling are on separate ends of separate lines. Right. So the, the, the scansion and, and everything about this really suggested a, a, a deep poetic sensibility. And then the irony of the images of these, these trains uh, out of cans that her father had made, but also the what's in Spanish and what's in English. That not eating watermelon at a certain time starts in Spanish, is primarily in English, but it's all in innuendo. Yes. Whereas the very direct uh, folk knowledge is all in Spanish. Uh, not eating ice cream when ice you're cream agitated. Cream. Or, exactly. Um, and, and at the same time, she's giving you the whole sweep of history for the first half of the 20th century and the way in which her family was caught up in that and the connection between her father's poverty during the Depression 
the Second World War and then her emergence as an artist um, uh, decades later. Yeah, and her emergence as an artist, I think, comes in through this. I had to briefly skip over it, but she uses a very famous image from the Mexican Revolution, which was this mm -hmm. iconic image of the Adelita or the Soldadera. Um, much has been written about this particular image. In, in fact, this is just a, a cropping of what was a larger photograph of these soldaderas looking out from this train that was leading to the northern division. And many Chicana scholars during the 70s and 80s wanted to recuperate the idea of the soldadera not as a, um, a woman who followed the soldiers, but that many of them were actually tacticians or strategic thinkers during the Mexican Revolution. So here she is uh, as a sort of surrogate for the artist, Celia, because she has no, she's rendered with faceless and is sort of overlooking these two, these two photo murals of her father, mm -hmm. of her father's own kind of craft making. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe with that, um, having been able to show a sampling of the work and uh, some of the discussion, uh, some of the argument you've put together, we could just open up and see if there are any um, any questions? And I, they do want us to have you speak into the microphone so it can be recorded for posterity. So uh, wait and then be profound. <laughs> <laughs> I can also repeat, we can also repeat the questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyone? Yeah, up here in front. No, they want, they want us to, they'll, they'll electrocute <laughs> us if, they, if you don't. <laughs> uh, could you uh, continue uh, situating uh, this artist in a uh, context, as you started to, in two senses. Um, uh, first, uh, how, to whom in the hundred uh, artists that uh, uh, John Noriega mentioned earlier, uh, does she most closely relate to and why mm. uh, in her generation, in her cohort? And secondly, in an international sense, uh, how does she relate, for example, to Catalan artists resident in Paris? I mean, uh, mm. she deserves, uh, evidently, an international context. So, uh, you know, or uh, uh, let's see, uh, a Turkish artist resident in France, or maybe Anna Mendieta uh, resident in the U.S. You bring up the Catalan. Yeah in part because of the idea of language, the politics right, of language, yes, yes. which would be interesting. I don't know who would be someone that would resemble her, but that, that would be a... That oh, would be a, might be Dali or Buñuel or uh, uh, Torres Garcia. I mean, I, I don't know to what degree these were references that she would have immediately evoked, but to, tar to begin to answer the first part of your question, she identifies with very... Uh, with fellow travelers, who she may have known while she was beginning to work as an artist like John Hernandez, um, who's from Texas, or with uh, artists who I think employed, tried to resolve the problem of using the international vocabulary of postmodernism without having it entirely trump the, the, the very specific content of being a Latina or a Chicana in the Southwest but without it also, with, and without it being co-opted as well, that is without allowing this content to be co-opted entirely by a kind of formalism. So I think she was very, she's very close and feels very, um, uh, uh, with Amalia Mesa Baines, for example, who is an installation artist, she feels a, as a fellow traveler, someone like Rupert Garcia, who though primarily a poster artist, used photo images from the Mexican Revolution, for example, from the Casa Sola archive, to, to sort of comment on, uh, uh, the way images, especially historic images, structure our knowledge of the present and contemporary art? It, it's actually, it's a very good question because um, she's always struck me as somebody who had a lot of affinities. And I would think even uh, someone like Mel Casas where there's right. uh, the play between image and text and at a very ironic level, deeply rooted in, in a particular place. And who was working in the early 70s. Yeah, and, and, and where, there's, uh, yeah, where they're picking up on pop art and, and kind of other contemporary uh, uh, movements. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I've always seen her as somewhat anomalous. This person in uh, Arlington, Texas, uh, who somehow made it to New York, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, she's always seemed, in the context of, of Chicano artists, uh, very distinct, even though there are these affinities, and in the context of uh, 
kind of more contemporary conceptual art, just someone who's just slightly outside the, the framework of what's being talked about, largely, I think, because of, of the uh, two language systems coming into play. And that, 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 that really it, it, it seriously narrows the, the, the pool of critics that can really elucidate what's going on there. Mm -hmm. and, and, to a larger audience. And I think this idea of belatedness is important because she really does come into her own as an artist, say, after the heroic moment of the Chicano art movement, right? Late, uh, late yeah. 60s, early 70s, on the one hand. So she really never felt part of a kind of art producing community. Um, she comes in late and. But she's also in, in her 40s when this exactly. is happening. Exactly. Uh, uh, you, when you said, you know, well, this is produced while she's still in graduate school, I was like, yeah, but she was 47. I mean, <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. No, and you see that this is really not just a sort of grad school um, yeah. thesis. Well, Yolanda Lopez was like that too. She was older than her teachers right, um, right. when she was going to, to graduate school. And had this training in terms of the, um, the sort of the, the code system of advertising and graphic yeah. arts, right? So she understood how images. Uh, the, the impact of images. Now, the, following up on this, because uh, one of the things I first heard about Celia is, well, she's just like Warhol because she was in graphic arts and then she went into this. And then, uh, it, then it stops. It's like you, you insinuate the connection with Warhol and then you, you drop it. I, is there nothing else to explore there? Or is it just a, a kind of a, a, a gesturing to, to make uh, the starting out in graphic arts and advertising seem more important? or? <laughs> Yeah. I don't know, in terms of Warhol or just yeah. with the graphic well, just arts? Well, it's, it's something that has been said about her. Yeah. It's an easy association, but then it's not explored much further. It's true, uh, although, I, I mean, I think she had, again, to go back to this idea that she, she in one, th in, on the one hand, because she's using camera-generated work, she really wants the, the imprint of the hand, yeah. so that the hand often becomes, the only, the only element or the only component that we see of, of her actual hand is in these drawings mm -hmm. that have this kind of graphic element, right? Mm -hmm. The kind of typography she uses, for example, is, all, is very specific. Sometimes it'll be a dot matrix in this, um, at Limito, for example, she'll have these arbitrary letters, A, E, um, some consonants, that will be in a, an array of typographic uh, lettering that's, that seem to make reference to how well, on the one hand, how elements of type are, mm -hmm. are, are content itself and how certain ideas get conveyed. I, I find it just fascinating because she, she's clearly, t uh, as an agenda, taking up mass-produced imagery and re reworking it. Uh, but it just seems to be in a very distinct vein that she's doing that. Um, so, any other questions? Uh, no? Mara? Kelly and Mara? Thank you. It's uh, great listening to you guys go back and forth about this work. And, uh, well, one thing, and then I have a question, one statement was, you know, when you're talking about this Warhol connection and the graphic artist, you could also say that about Kruger, too, right? Because right, that's right. part of Kruger's training, so it seems like yeah. at that moment that this is something that gets recuperated. But you keep talking about her, you know, you know coming uh, to the fore with her work after you know, the big kind of flurry or introduction of the uh, Chicano movement art at that moment, 60s, 70s, and then you're talking about, you know, kind of modernist and postmodernist practice. I wonder if you could elucidate what that is for us that you're thinking about. I mean, I think we can all say, okay, we know about this, we're in this room, we're in this museum, and so we should know, but I, I wonder if you could specify specifically what you're talking about in terms of when you say, you know, she could have easily been put in, you mentioned Kruger, but other people, and also, you know, what kind of practices you're talking about specifically uh, with that. Well, I would, uh, primarily, I think if there's one overarching um, register of Chicano art from the, from the movement was that it was very much about expressing as one of the important um, exhibitions that gathered this work together in, the 19, in 1991 was uh, affirmation and resistance. The idea of affirming, usually through figurative work, the values of both family, religion, uh, community, and the, and the possibility of, of resisting being completely assimilated by uh, mainstream American values. 
the, the importance of the barrio, for example, would be one way of, of, of addressing that um, in many of the early murals or, or the poster art of someone like um, Esther Hernandez, who created a very inform important poster uh, that was an indictment of the pesticides that were being used in the, in the farms that was a, also playful. And actually, I think that's, a, that's kind of an interesting uh, antecedent to Celia's work because it used playfulness insofar as it's the cover of the sun-made raisins that became sun-mad raisins. And instead of the beautiful um, sun maiden, it was a skeleton holding this sort of basket. So uh, in that sense, but that had a more kind of, that led, I suppose what Celia does is not, is not determine the, uh, the ultimate meaning of, of, say, what a poster art would have done, had a, had a particular uh, message, and that communicative message was very important, right? Celia allows her communications to be much more um, open-ended or, 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 or porous. I had the pleasure of seeing the personal odyssey in New York at the Intergallery, Latin American Gallery, and then also at Intersection in San Francisco in 1990. I actually wrote something. Um, but I remember two very different readings, that, and in both cases she was greatly admired. One was indeed that it was autobiographical, mm. and mm -hmm. the title was Personal Odyssey. Right. And it had come after a show at Intergallery the year before called Autobiography in Her Own Image. Then when it was shown in San Francisco, Personal Odysseys, it was read much more as very successful conceptual art, and mm. probably read less autobiographically. But she was admired in both spaces. It's interesting. Why do, you, do you have an idea of why, of why that happened so quickly, that switch? Because, I mean, it really, I, think, I do think there was a kind of dismissiveness on its reception because it read, because there's a, there's a way in which you could, one could read it only as autobiographical. Well, I think the settings were totally different. Mm. Intersection is a, particularly then, was an experimental right. alternative space in San Francisco. And so it was a great pleasure in seeing her her play, visually mm -hmm. and verbally. And in the intergallery, I think it was more expected it would be autobiographical. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I want to thank you so much for this. It just dawned on me that I was at an award ceremony where she got from the Women's Caucus for the Arts a Lifetime Achievement Award, and I didn't know who she was. At CAA. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's right. And now yeah. I know. And now I know why she got this award. And it's fabulous. And thank you so much for rediscovering or discovering or sharing her with us. It's, it's so, so important. I, I agree. Um, she's someone, uh, all of the artists in the series, uh, whose work I've just tremendously admired, but I've also been moved by it. Um, uh, you know, and, and moved into certain kinds of contemplation uh, that, are, that are hard to get at, uh, and just astounded that there, there hasn't been more of a critical engagement, um, even a negative one, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, to, to create a dialogue. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm just thrilled at, uh, you know, knowing uh, Sally actually better than I knew Roberto at the time, uh, uh, being able to hook them up and seeing that this is a good fit, that uh, the, the differences in age uh, and, 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 and outlook and everything else, but, but there was a certain bonding around an appreciation of the very complex way image and word relate to each other. Uh, since Robert's a poet and a photo historian, I thought, you can't, that's like being a schizophrenic. Uh, he's saying the, the poets play in the complete ambiguity of language and historians deal in the indexicality of the photographic image, you know, and that there's something in between that that seems to have the potential to really resonate with what Celia Munoz is doing herself. And, uh, and that's my hope is that the book will inspire outrage, anger, but, but get, realize there's, there's more to talk about in her work than, than what's been written uh, in the book, but the book is a, it's a necessary, and, and I think it's a, it's a very accomplished starting point. So I've been very happy to 
uh, be part of the process that help facilitate it. Um, I should also add that um, going, going back to the moment when I met Celia, it's no coincidence that across the board, artists of my generation and younger see her as a, 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 one of the most important antecedents. So the, those artists who I was hanging out with in Guadalajara, Daniel Martinez, Mario Ibarra, uh, uh, mm -hmm. And, and, and others, and then every time I would mention writing about Celia, oh, well, Celia's work has been so important, has been important to our, to our practice, right? Mm -hmm. It really was a kind of light and uh, another option. I think that was, that was, I think, another way that it both spoke to family, all those family narratives that we, that we, that we live and take with us with, uh, without having to um, yield or sacrifice to the, to the rigor and the complexity of of the way she uses signs and, and, yeah. and the and medium. I, and, I, and I think there's a larger group of artists that fall into this category that, that demand um, a kind of informed intention. And I think at one end, on the writerly side, uh, someone like uh, Jose Antonio Burciaga, mm. at one end, and at, at another, someone like Maricela Norte, right. where because they are so thoroughly bilingual and because they have a poetic or uh, in, in Antonio Jose's case, a, a, a comedian sensibility, they're able to make a very artistic use of, of that interplay rather than a didactic one uh, and really open up the possibility that there's more there than you can capture in a declarative statement uh, when two languages, two cultures uh, kind of come together and, and whether it's a collision or, or, or not. Um, and, and I think it, it just it speaks to the larger pool of artists that she is exemplary with in that, but, but it, it's a phenomenon as well. And the phenomenon has to do uh, with the existence of more than one cultural and linguistic framework within which expression occurs. Mm -hmm. and, and how do we really integrate that into a discussion of the arts? I think Maricela Norte is a great example. Mm -hmm. because, and I think in the, uh, if, Cel if Celia was an artist who more and more began to incorporate poetic text. Uh, Maricela is a poet who has begun to incorporate photographic yeah. art, uh, photographic um, and uh, archives. And, and archives, yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting comparison. Yeah. Do we have time for a, another question or do we have another question for time? <laughs> that might be the moment to... Well, we are going to have a, a signing, I guess, upstairs. So, we're supposed uh, to be whisked away. Yes, so uh, we, we, we will whisk, whisk away were the words used to the bookstore. Uh, and uh, I do encourage you to join us up there. And this is, uh, I don't know how many books we have, but uh, uh, fight for them. Because uh, it's, it's really a great, uh, a great text and, and really, I think, gives insight into an important artist uh, that hopefully we'll be hearing even more about. Thank Thanks, you. John.